Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. And today we're going to be talking about water demands and management strategies for pistachio trees. Now, this is extra important, I think, uh, especially as the uh, California uh, Central uh, Valley area finds themselves in a bigger, bigger uh, drought situation. Um, the management of trees and water becomes more important. I think the pistachio, we're going to learn from an expert today on this, but I think they actually use less water than maybe an almond and uh, more importantly can handle stress and drought uh, and maybe a little saltier soil, uh, saltier water too. So uh, it's interesting to me because uh, a lot of times when you give up some of these things like uh, and have such a hardy tree, maybe you don't get such a, uh, a good tasting nut out of it or a good tasting fruit. But in this case, I love pistachios. Anybody who's been to our booth at World Ag knows we have a lot of pistachios in there. And I spend a lot of time eating those because I love them so much. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, we're really fortunate to have uh, Connor Cunningham with us today. He's a territory sales manager for Jane, working um, in their ag tech group and also working in the water management consulting services group as well. Connor's got a lot of very satisfied, happy customers that are getting more yields out of their crops and, uh, and saving water at the same time. And, you know, that's a really important com combination, uh, especially for this time. So uh, one thing I certainly know about Connor and I've witnessed is his commitment to his customers to make things right, to not just tell them what to do, but more importantly, show them how to do it. So really a coaching, consulting type of relationship is what Connor is able to establish with his customers. And if you're lucky enough to have that relationship, then uh, then you know how good it can work out for your farm or your ranch. So uh, Connor, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the introduction and for the kind words. Yeah, you, you bet. You've uh, You've definitely earned them. So Connor, am I right about pistachio trees? Are they a little hardier? Do they take the the, the climate and uh, and different things we throw at them a little bit better? Yeah, they're they're definitely uh, you know thinking of a metaphor. They're they're kind of like a scrapper, uh, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, they're, they're they're very scrappy. You know, they they are a very hardy tree, which we'll be talking about in today's presentation. And uh, depending on how you manage them, they they can indeed take less water than an almond tree does. You know, we do have that famous example of a grower that we worked with here, and uh, I won't take any credit for it. Corey will take all the credit. Uh, he actually was able to work with a grower who was in some dire straits when it came to water availability and was able to grow some pistachios and actually produce a crop off of it with only eight inches of water. Uh, so that that's, I mean, that's an incredible testimony to Corey's skill set and his knowledge and also to, you know, how hardy these trees really are. So, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, I think, a great crop for the region. Uh, given given those traits and those attributes. Yeah, Connor, so I'm thinking about that eight inches. I'm thinking, you know, maybe an almond tree is closer to 50 inches of water a year, maybe somewhere in the 40s. Uh, what would a normal season pistachio would take? How much water? Yeah, so we'll, be, we'll see you here in the slides here in a little bit. But yeah, typically what we would like <laughs> in a normal right. water year, what we would like is about 36 to 40 inches of water. Yeah. Per percent. Yeah. Per acre on, on the pistachio trees. Yeah. So with eight inches, that's really amazing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a fraction of what they normally <laughs> would need to, to, to survive and to grow on. Right. I would think uh, I, my, my worry would be uh, uh, dead trees not actually producing a crop that year. So, uh, right. well, this is going to be fun to hear about uh, and, yes. and, uh, and learn about. So uh, let's, let's get started. Great. Yeah. So let's dive into it. So, what we'll talk about is we'll talk, we'll start here talking a little bit about kind of the state of the state. So I am the kind of guy that I like to have the bad news first, I like to rip the bandaid off and it makes the good news seem that much greater. So let's go ahead and start off with, I guess, some of the doom and gloom, right? So obviously here in the Central Valley, water is very expensive. On the West side, folks are paying 1200 bucks per acre foot of water. And then if they have to have any additional water on top of that, we're paying 
you know, like $2,000 an acre foot. So water is very expensive, but we need it to be able to produce a crop, right? And on top of that, labor, labor is also expensive. And then a lot of our input costs have also gone up. On top of that, like we were talking about before we had started the presentation here, we're also going through this mega drought right here. And with that, that can cause some negative effects in our crop. You can see some of the effects that I have listed here on the slide. We can have missing nuts or what we call blanks in our crop. We could have a lower splitting percentage, which will, you know, when we take our crop in, we'll actually get less in return uh, for that splitting percentage being lower. And then we'd also would expect reduced yields. A lot of the, a lot of the times the pistachios are grown in salty conditions, whether that's salty water or that's a saline soil. And because of that, we'll actually see that the pistachios will need to consume more water because they're under what's called osmotic stress. It's, it's taking more energy to pull that water from the salt solution and be able to use that in their natural processes. And so we need to put on more water to try to make up for that, to try to, to work around that binding that's going on in the soil and between the water molecules themselves. So again, this seems very doom and gloom, right? <laughs> but like I said, there is a bright, a bright side to all of this. So here's the good news, right? We were just talking about this here to start is that pistachio trees are incredibly resilient. So this is really important for exactly what we were talking about. A lot of the places here in the Central Valley are what we would consider marginal soils, right? A lot of other crops wouldn't be able to hang in these types of growing conditions, but thankfully pistachio trees can. So why is that good? Well, it's good because if we're the owner of this land, we can still run a business, create a product, and be able to make money at the end of the day on a soil that's not necessarily considered good for many other crops. We can do that with pistachio trees. And so what we're gonna be talking about today is some of the other good news is that there's some common practices or maybe not so common for some folks that we use to, pr to produce pistachios here in the Central Valley. And then along with that, there's been some new research that's come out as of late that we can use as part of our management strategy to better produce pistachios as well. And so one of the things that we like to say as well here is, what we're going to be looking at is different ways to measure some of our practices so that way we can become better managers as a whole. And I think that's why a lot of people tune into these webinars, right? And we go to these industry events is we all just want to be better water managers. We want to be better at the end of the day for our farm. We want to be better uh, growers and consultants and for the farmers that we work with. So I've said it number of times here on this webinar, and then I'll say it uh, more and more is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? It's so. so so true, Connor, and that's the one thing I just really love about uh, working with growers, is that uh, one thing they always want to know is, uh, how do I grow a better crop? Right. Well, you know, they're passionate about that. They really, they're interested, they want, they're, they're enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when you can deliver that, boy, uh, it, it goes a long ways uh, with them. Yes, yes, definitely. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and take an aside really quick. A lot of the topics that we'll be talking about today are not meant to be blanket. These are just various types of techniques that we can take back with us. And if we can pull one nugget out of this and use it as part of our practices, great. Otherwise, we can store it for a rainy day and bring it out as we need. So I just want to go ahead and take a moment to make sure that I, I make that statement. So this is not meant to be generally applied to everybody's situation. And we'll see why that's important here coming up. Yeah, really a good point. I appreciate you mentioning it. And then I also want to mention that uh, we do have the Q&A and the chat open. So if you have some questions or you want to make a comment, please put them in there and I'll, uh, I'll pass them on when it's appropriate. And uh, we've been giving some really cool Jane gear to people uh, who've asked some good questions. So uh, there's a reward there too. That's right, and I'm jealous. I might ask myself a question just so I can get some of that here. <laughs> All right, so uh, what are some of the common practices and what are some of the things that we already know? We talked about this at the beginning as well. 36 to 40 inches of water are needed annually for pistachios. 
And from an irrigation system standpoint, that breaks down to about six gallons per hour per tree and at an application rate of 0.03 acre inches per hour. So if we're thinking about what kind of system we're going to need, making sure that our system's up to snuff, or if we're developing new ground, we want to keep these things in mind. Again, we have talked uh, agnosium almost about the high salt tolerance <laughs> of pistachio trees. And then another common practice, I guess we could say is a good rule of thumb for nut trees in general, is using an MAD of 50%. So I don't know how many folks are familiar with that acronym MAD. Are you familiar with that acronym, Richard? I think it's a uh, maximum allowable depletion. There you go. That, that is definitely one version of it. I, I say manageable allowable depletion personally. And uh, so what that means is that we're going to fill up our soil profile to what we call field capacity. So we're going to fill it all the way up before we start to have that deep percolation. And then we're going to allow that soil and we're going to manage it to deplete to 50% of that field capacity. And that field capacity that we're going to be checking in at is that top three feet of that soil, what we call the effective rooting zone. And the reason that we call it an effective rooting zone is because pistachios, again, talking about their resilience, pistachios have a very industrious root system. And so they, they like to put out a lot of roots and wherever there's water, roots will grow. Mm -hmm. And we've seen in backhoe pits that Pistachios will reach all the way out to the center of the road. They'll reach in between the trees. They're very good at growing roots. However, when we're thinking about management and we're thinking about irrigation timing and irrigation frequency, and also when we're injecting our fertilizer and our amendments, right? We wanna make sure that we're keeping it within that top three feet of soil. Sure, we can go ahead and soak the soil, grow roots down to five, six, maybe seven feet, right? But where all that action's going on, where all that feeding is going on is in that top three feet. So we really wanna pay attention to that. And there's different methods of doing that, which again, we'll see later on in the presentation. I'm so, and most typically, go ahead. I was gonna say, I'm so glad you mentioned that because um, you know I, I do hear a lot of people say, oh, you have to water deep, water deep, water deep. And you're actually putting a cap on that deep, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think when, when people think deep, they water too long, push nutrients and water past the root zone, and it's sure. actually wasted that, is that, right? Right, 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 exactly. And, you know, I, I've made this joke before, and I think it's pretty funny, but the number of times that I've been to these ag tech talks and, and these uh, various industry events, and you hear people get up on stage and say, hey, if you're watering down past your root zone, you're, you're flushing your dollars down the toilet. Well, I'd probably be about $50 richer, right? And, uh, <laughs> but all joking aside, it is definitely something that we want to be aware of when we're managing that if we don't need to be flushing water out the bottom for some sort of a leaching practice, then we can definitely manage that much more tightly, especially with how tight all of our costs are in pistachio production in today's day and age. Yeah, okay, good point, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and so another very common management practice or a very common site that we'll see in pistachio orchards here in the Central Valley is that they're typically grown on double line drip. And this is for a number of reasons, one of which is for disease management. And also we have the ability now with how good our emitters are that we can actually put the water right at the roots so that way we're keeping all that water where it's being used. And so you can either use something like what Jane produces, the, Am, the Amnon inline emitters, where that's emitters built into the drip line themselves that set the spacing at various flow rates. Or what's also common is actually putting blank tubing out there, and then using a button style emitter like the click tip emitters as well. So Connor, we, we, we've got our first yeah. question coming in and it has to do with the double drip lines. Sure. And uh, they're, they're, you know, they, they wanna be sure that the double drip line actually uh, sets a, a, a good enough wetting pattern to get all, all the roots. Yes, definitely. You can, the double line drip is an excellent way to be able to disperse the water in such a way that you do develop, you can develop a healthy root zone with double line drip. And I'll actually, this is a great segue into the next one because there's various methods of doing that. So in this example here, this is actually using the button style emitters where when the tree's really young, right? 
going back to the six gallons per hour model that we had talked about earlier, we can put out two gallon per hour emitters, right? And now the very first year of that crop, they're not consuming a whole lot of water, right? right? So we can put one button emitter right at the base of the tree to get that established. We're going to go ahead and get that, that get past that shock phase, get that, start getting those roots developed with this first emitter. After year two, we're going to want to go ahead and move those lines out at least a foot away. So that way we avoid any sort of phytophthora by over soaking that, that base right there. We, we want to make sure to avoid that. We want to put down enough water that we meet those demands, but we don't want to soak it and have it pooling at the base of that tree either, because then we will be subject to fungal growth. But then after year two, we can go ahead and come 36 inches off of each side of that tree on the opposite side and put two more emitters, each at two gallons per hour, three emitters, that gives us our six gallon per hour application rate that we need. So we can see that we can actually add emitters to match the tree's demand as it continues to grow. So that way we ensure that we're not putting more water on than we need, but we're meeting the tree's needs as well. And then we can manage it as we'll, again, we'll see here in, in a few more slides. So that way we make sure to develop the healthy root system that we need. Yeah, well, this is really cool. And I like this visual because it helps me see the triangle pattern here, mm -hmm. right, of, uh, of the drip. And uh, wow, uh, yeah, I can see that you would get a great coverage there. Yes, definitely. And there's lots of different ways to do this. This is just one example. There's other guys that will use uh, lower flow emitters and they'll put more emitters They'll put like six or 12 emitters per tree. It just depends on the constraints. Again, this is not meant to be, hey, everybody needs to do it exactly like this. There's, there's lots of different tools that we have available that we can use that will fit your situation and your system demands. Yeah. Okay, and then we have another question coming in or comment. Uh, let's see, uh, in heavy clay soils with high water holding capacity, can't when water is available, water blanking and extending the root zone be a benefit for a very mature orchard? I'm just, I don't know if I translated that very well, Connor, I'm sorry. It's okay, uh, try to repeat it one more time. I think I understand what's being asked, but. Let's try it one more time. Yeah, so I, I guess the, they're talking about the extending most root zones uh, being a benefit for a very mature orchard. Would, 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 would that be a benefit? Uh, especially in heavy clay soils, right? Well, this is what they're, what they're battling. Right, so in, in a heavy clay soil, you're, you're definitely gonna wanna make sure that you extend that time in between when you're applying your irrigation. Again, we, we wanna avoid having standing water on the surface because we really want to avoid phytophthora, right? Pistachios don't like what we call wet feet. They're much like almonds and they're also like grapevines as well. Neither, all three of these don't like wet feet. We want to make sure that we're putting on enough to soak, but not to have standing water. And you can utilize your heavy soil to extend that period of time between irrigation. Again, the, the pistachios are going to have an industrious root zone. And as a rule of thumb, what you see above ground, you're going to see below ground as far as a root structure. So with the clay soil, you're probably going to have a, a wider footprint just because that water is going to be able to move more laterally than it would in a lighter soil or a sandier soil. So I hope that answers this person's question I, I, from based that from what I can understand. Yeah. Okay, great. And if it hasn't, I, I hope they'll uh, uh, write in for a little bit more clarification. Yes, please do. Mm -hmm. We'll be happy to go over it some more. So some of the new research that's come out has uh, talked about different times of the year when we can actually apply stress. So this is uh, one of the management strategies that we might be able to implore when we're thinking about our irrigation scheduling and our irrigation management. So last year, the research extension, the UC research extension, conducted some studies on how we can manage stress to our benefit. So typically, pistachios have three growing stages with a post-harvest stage at the end of the year. And during the study, what they found was that during certain stages of the growth cycle, we can actually stress the trees to 50% of ET and not have any negative impact on yields. 
So what does that actually mean in practical terms? So if we were to stress the trees during stage two and during the post harvest stage of the season, we can find that during stage two, we'd only need to put down 7.11 inches of water. And then during the post harvest, we'd only need to put down 2.37 inches, which if we think about that for the whole season, we could actually save almost nine and a half inches of water by implementing this management strategy. And heck, even if you weren't to go all the way to 50%, if you were to manage to 70% of ET and still be okay, if you wanted to take a little bit more of a conservative approach, again, you'd still be able to have some serious savings across the entire season by managing your stress in such a way. Hmm. Interesting. So the key again is stage two and post harvest mm -hmm. would be the times to employ these strategies. Exactly. And they were able to take it all the way down to 50% of ET. And they claimed that there was no negative impacts on the yield at the end of the season. And you might even you know, take some of that water that you saved and apply a little bit more during stage three if you wanted to hedge your bets a little bit. But still, you can really manage in such a way that you can accumulate some savings at the end of the year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'll take that nine and a half inches of water. Uh, Definitely. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, it, you know, I'll go back to the slide here before we look at the next one. If you were to also think about that too, nine and a half inches, that's great. And a lot of these growers are growing on 150, 300, 500 acres. If you take 9.4 and you multiply that across hundreds of acres, that is some serious savings, especially if you're paying significant money for water here in the Central Valley. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, $1,000 an acre foot you were quoting earlier make a huge difference. Definitely. Definitely. And so some of the additional research that has come out too as of late, some of the research done by the Pistachio Research Board, uh, they actually started off with one research product and found some uh, happy side products that came with that. So initially, the research board was looking at evaluating the KC curves and seeing if there was any changes in that information. And so what they found was by doing this research product project, excuse me, they did find some new KC information, but along with that, one of the happy uh, side products that came from that was that they found that pistachios didn't need as much water as we historically thought. So if you look on the screen here, I have this spreadsheet that we drew up and you can see that there's a side-by-side -side comparison. And you can see the highlighted cells show the new KC values, but really the big takeaway is at the very bottom of the spreadsheet here you'll see two highlighted boxes, or excuse me, two bolded boxes here. The one on the left shows that historically, the KC curves predicted that every season, pistachios would require 47 inches of water. But with this new information, what they found was that pistachios actually only required, based on the predictive models, not actual what the pistachios were consuming, but based on the predictive models, that they required 40, almost 41 inches of water instead. So that's about six inches of savings right there. Now, again, I, I just, I have to say this as a disclaimer, none of this has had any sort of hard foundings. This is definitely just one research product that project that is still being worked on, but it's still very encouraging to see that we're seeing some of the positive results leaning in this direction. And in some cases, they found that there was even 20 to 30% less water than what we originally had thought in the past. Again, this all depends on your system, your region, your soil type, your management practices. But this is definitely some encouraging information for us producing pistachios here. Yeah, it sure is. Um, talk about giving you some flexibility as a grower to really right. manage. Right, definitely. So, I mean, between your managing your stress during your stages and then also looking at reducing your overall consumption, this gives us a, a couple of really great tools to start working from. So now that we've looked at some of the research, let's look at our soils, right? Soils is definitely something that can't really be changed, but if you know a little bit more about how your soil operates, you can leverage that to your benefit. So going back to the person's question that, <clears throat> excuse me, wrote in about the clay soil, 
let's, you know, your soil, each different soil has a different holding capacity. And we can actually utilize and leverage that, especially when it comes to what I call free water. I might be the only person that calls it that. I don't know. But we definitely have free water that falls from the sky, or so I've heard, here in the Central Valley. And we can actually try to manage around that to help save some water early on in the season. So I was actually very surprised when I was doing research for this presentation. I found out that on average here in the Central Valley, we get about six inches of rainfall annually. So let's keep that in mind. So how does, how does our soil hold on to that? Well, you can see on the screen here that I pulled some free information offline where it talks about the different types of available water holding capacities of various types of soil textures. So each soil texture will hold a different amount. And, each, and with that, each soil also has a different infiltration rate. So we need to know how does our soil react when we put water on it so that way we can manage it better. So let's go ahead and look at an example here. So if we think about soils, I like to think of soils, this is the way I explain it very commonly, is I think of soils as either a five gallon bucket or a two gallon, two and a half gallon bucket, excuse me. And I like to think of them as cascading buckets, right? So they fill one, right? Let's say we have a five gallon bucket, we fill it up with five gallons, and if we put on a six gallon, what happens, Richard? It overflows. Exactly, it overflows and it spills into the next bucket, which is the next layer of our soil. And then we fill that one up and then it spills over and moves into the next one. That's exactly how our soil works. It's kind of like a sponge, you know, you fill, the sponge will soak up some water and as soon as you put some more water on, it then falls out the bottom. So for easy math, because I'm not great at math, let's just say that each layer, each foot of our soil holds 1.5, acre inches of water, available water. We have a three foot root zone. So if we take three feet and multiply that by 1.5 acre inches, that gives us 4.5 acre inches of plant available water. This is water that the plant can freely pull from the soil and it doesn't have to work super hard to pull off of the soil molecules. So if we think about six inches of annual rain coming in every winter, well, six inches will not only fill up this profile in this example, but it will even leach some of the salts, if we have salts in our soil, and percolate down deep into the deeper part of the soil and potentially even start to fill up some of that aquifer down below. So this is something that we can think about when we're managing our soil. If we know that we have a heavier soil, for example, we're, we're going to have a bigger gas tank for example, versus a lighter soil, we're going to have a smaller gas tank. So we need to keep these things in mind when we're managing and scheduling out our irrigation. Do we do longer sets and we do them less frequently, or do we do shorter sets and do them more frequently? So, yes. so Connor, we have somebody who wants a clarification. Could we go great. back one slide, please? Sure. So in this uh, table that you have, available water capacity by soil texture, let's just use fine sand. Right. And let's use the one inch because I'm an optimist. So, sure. so we'll use one inch. Mm -hmm. So that is one inch of available water in a foot a cube of soil. Correct. Yep. And so if you had a plant that uh, only went a foot, the most water it could get out of there was an inch at a time, right? If you didn't replenish. Yeah, so if you fill that up, all it can hold, the, the max amount that it can hold before it spills out the bottom is one inch. So yeah. yes, if you filled it up, there's one inch that's available to the plant that it can get a hold of. Yep. Right. And so, and then if you just kept watering it, it'd push out the bottom. It wouldn't be available to that plant. And if a plant needed th four and a half inches, like you said on the, the next slide, you'd have to replenish that a couple times that week to get to the four, four and a half. Or, or it's gonna go down to the next level. So that's, you know, you have to look at it as your entire effective rooting zone. When we go, go back to talking about the effective rooting zone. So, you know, yes, if you're, if you're just managing to that top foot, then yeah, you're just gonna to have to keep refilling it. But typically we're not in a pistachio argument, right? We're looking at three feet. So right. you'd have three available inches that, that you could pull from, from the top three feet, assuming that it was all a fine sand, right? And then right. in the next example, you know, 1.5, that's like a fine sandy loam, for example, or even a sandy loam. 
So yeah. if we look at the math here, we have four and a half inches available to us of water that the tree could work from. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. That really helps give a visual. So thank you. Uh -huh. So if we want to look at, again, talking about our soil profile, right? This is data from last year. This is some information that we pulled out of Jane Logic showing the soil profile depth by depth of the soil moisture probe. And you can see in this highlighted area right here, in one rain event, we got all the way down to 20 inches. Well, that's over half of our target root zone filled up with water right there in one rain event. So going back to being able to measure it so that way we can manage it more, having access to information like this and tracking this type of information can really help you on the front half of the season, looking at how long is it that I can last before I have to turn on irrigation. I can actually delay irrigation if I have if I'm tracking this sort of information, you can easily do this manually by going out and augering down and digging holes. But having access to soil moisture probes gives you this insight on a more frequent basis. And quite frankly, soil moisture probes really aren't that expensive. You can, the technology has gotten good and it's become more widespread that it's brought that cost down for these devices. So it's much more manageable for people to employ this type of technology on their ranch. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, it goes back to what you were saying earlier. You can't uh, manage what you're not measuring. Yep. And uh, boy, this is true for me. I always uh, overestimate how much water is being drawn out of the soil, right? I'm always too quick to water. But if I have something like this, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll delay because I know for sure I'm okay. Uh, right. If I don't know, then of course I'm going to keep over applying because I want to be safe. Right, exactly. And that's that's really the benefit of these types of devices, and these tools, I should say. I really like to call them tools because that's exactly what they are. The devices nowadays are really, really top notch. The ones that we work with at Jane, we, we use the top of the line models here at Jane to really ensure that we're getting really good data. Because again, another thing that we like to say is good data in, good data out. Yeah. And so with something, again, you know, additional information that you get from a soil moisture probe is exactly the types of screenshots that I have here that I pulled from Jane Logic. We can see as those lines go up in this first picture right here, that's the, the soil profile filling up. And then we can actually watch that dry down, that stair stepping pattern of the roots pulling that water out of the soil. And then we're also looking at, you know, the diurnal changes of it evaporating in the root pole. So that way we can really very fine tunely track when we need to put that water back on. And then on top of that, you know, the growers really like this infiltration widget that we have here on the screen. They really like to know exactly what they're, what they're doing when they're putting water on, how efficiently are they putting it on? Are they going, are they shooting down past that effective root zone or are they actually managing it the way that they thought they were They're saying, man, you know what, if I put on 18 hours, am I soaking my root zone like I thought I was, or am I shortchanging myself? Or on the opposite, am I, am I putting it down where I don't need to? And I'll show you an example here. So this is some more information that I pulled from one of our customers out of Jane Logic. So you can see this very first event that we applied, it took us 24 hours. And in this example, we wanted to soak down to 48 inches. That was our target. It took us 24 hours to soak all the way down to 48 inches. The next two irrigation events, it only took us 12 hours huh. to soak that same 48 inches. So if you didn't, if you were just going based off of a guesstimate that, yeah, you know, it takes me 24 hours to soak all the way down to 48 inches, you would have wasted a full 24 hours on the next two irrigation events just by not having access and being and tracking it in such a way. So really the moral of the story here is depending on what your soil moisture status is, mm. it's going to affect your infiltration rate and how you apply your irrigation. So again, having access and tracking this type of information is crucial to managing your water more tightly, especially in a time when things are already so tight cost-wise. Yeah, I hadn't seen that visual before. That really hits home, right? What you can yeah. do. I was really uh, happy to pull this out of, out of the Jane Logic system because it really was like, oh man, this is a great visual. It, it's pictures speak a thousand words, right? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's, a, that's a big water savings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, you know, this isn't a doctored image. This is real life. This is what we do with water management services. We, we track this type of information and help growers capitalize 
on these types of savings. So what are the next steps in the process is, again, another thing that we can manage, another tool that we have available to us is using something like satellite imagery. We use AgriLogix with, with our Jane Logic system. And with this, we're able to track water consumption week to week. So let's take a step back, right? Let's, let's think through our management. We're, we're tracking our free water during the springtime and the winter. And then we're thinking about our water holding capacity in our soil. We have our soil moisture probe tracking our refill and our dry down, tracking our irrigation efficiency. Now we're going to look at how our crops are responding and pulling that out of the soil. So that way we can start to bring that into how we're going to be building our irrigation schedule, right? So with the satellite imagery, it's telling us our ETC, it's our observed ETC. And so we can see week to week how much water is being pulled off of that field specifically. And this is so much more powerful than a public model. There's nothing wrong with public model. You can pull really great information out of these public models. I subscribe to the UC's email and I use that as a counter check every single week. But with the satellite imagery, you're getting a very specific, your very own custom ETC for that field. And from that, you can deduce what your, your field specific KC curve is. So you can be that much more fine tuned with your management year after year. So, so I, can use, I can use this. I don't even need a soil moisture sensor in the field. I don't need anything. I can just use the satellite imaging and connect it to uh, Jane Logic and, and be okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we do have our Jane Logic remote or our Jane Logic uh, sensorless package. So you can just utilize the satellite information by itself and have access to how much water is being taken out each week. And if you put that back on, assuming that your soil is full, you can use that as a very powerful management tool. Yeah, I feel like I just hit the easy button. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I need to go pick one of those up. <laughs> So if we now we can start to bring all these things in, formulate saying, OK, I know how much moisture is in my soil currently. I can see how much was pulled last week. Now I can start to go a little forward facing and I can compare this probe data and the satellite data to what's coming up next. Or again, you know, if you want to pull it yourself and, and do the hand feel method. Again, there's more than one way to skin the cat, but now we can start to compare it to the forecast. So, you know, we can compare that to the crop models like we had talked about earlier. We can look at these new KC curves and see what's predicted for the next coming weeks. We can check up, upcoming forecasts, you know, with the Jane Logic system, we have the forecast for the ETO, the temperature, humidity, rain, wind, and you can see that seven days in advance. So, you're going to start to bring all these things together. You can see how it's all starting to come together. How much water does my soil hold? What, what do I have available to play with? What was consumed last week? What's coming up? And then really the next logical step after that is to just create a schedule. So mm -hmm. then you can start to create a schedule and dice those hours up according to your infiltration rate and how your soil holds the water and how it dries down over the course of the week. Again, there's a lot of free information available online or you could use something like Jane Logic to help streamline things and make it a little bit more efficient. And then really, realistically, kind of the last step in the process that brings it full circle is the automation. So I've received a ton of calls over this past season of folks that are interested in utilizing automation because it takes that task, that kind of that mundane task, off of the irrigators and off of the field workers and it allows growers to actually stretch those labor dollars more because they have the labor there already why don't you take them and use them for the things that are more important that the machines can't do and let them take care of that and then let the machines take care of the things that are just simple on off turning valves over and over and then recording your flow and your water consumption and your water output for you. So really that's where it kind of comes full circle. You know, you have the data coming in, you make those decisions, you create the automated schedule and then you hit run and you let the system take it from there. And then you just rinse and repeat. Yeah, it's a really good point, right? Because the math is not complicated, but there is a lot of equations and a lot of inputs that have to be uh, reviewed to, to do it. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'd rather spend my time doing something else and let the automation uh, take take. Yeah. 
Definitely, definitely. And I know that there's kind of the scare that automation is going to come around and start taking people's jobs away. And we definitely aren't about that. And so I just kind of want to clear the air about that, that this is not meant to take jobs away, but it's meant to make people's lives more efficient. It's yeah. kind of like the assembly line versus building a car piece by piece, one guy in a garage, right? Right. Yeah, look, I've been selling smart controllers for over 12 years, and uh, we haven't put one person out of a job yet. There you go. <laughs> it's, it's just... Exactly. Exactly. Yep. It's just making everybody's lives a little bit more efficient and a little bit more streamlined. Yeah. So, yeah. So with that, that really does bring me to the end of my presentation here. I know I went a little longer today, so I do appreciate everybody that's still here for hanging on. Yeah. Connor, this is fantastic. Of course, we're going to hang on. This was good, valuable information, which uh, I really appreciate. Um, you uh, took some uh, complex ideas today and put them in a form that was uh, really understandable. So I really appreciate that. So thanks for coming on today and going through that with us. And to all of you that uh, are watching today, thanks very much for spending some of your day with us. As you know, we put all of our trainings, over 200 now, on the janesusa.com uh, webpage, uh, forward slash trainings, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, and you know, we extract the audio out of these so you can learn while you're driving or working. I love seeing people with their headphones on, uh, educating themselves as they're working, you know, learning while working. It's a, it's a great way to go. So again, uh, Connor, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. Thank Thanks you, very everyone. much.